Hello and welcome to the Top Story, a podcast with the headlines of the day from our correspondents around the world. I'm Qi Zhi. Coming up in this edition, questions and concerns now surround U.S. President Joe Biden's candidacy after he held a news conference at the NATO summit in Washington. China is urging the Philippines to stop baseless allegations on the South China Sea issue. And the world has marked its 35th Population Day, as the global population is expected to reach a peak of around 10.4 billion in around 60 years. We begin in North America. U.S. President Joe Biden has used a high-stakes news conference to insist he will remain in the presidential race. Pressure is growing on Biden to step aside, with more Democrats coming out urging him to end his campaign. Nathan King reports from Washington D.C. Well, it was a combative performance by President Biden, saying he is not going anywhere. At his most lucid, when actually, ironically, talking. About detailed policy questions over NATO, over Israel-Palestine,、uh, over the、uh, work he has done、uh, domestically too, he did make a few verbal flubs. He confused his vice president Kamala Harris, for example,、uh, with former President Trump, his challenger. I wouldn't have picked Vice President Trump to be vice president, but I think she was not qualified to be president. So let's start there. And now I want to hand it over to the president of Ukraine, who has as much courage as he has determination. Ladies and gentlemen, President Putin. President Putin. He's going to beat President Putin. President Zelensky. I'm so focused on beating Putin, we got to worry about it. Anyway. But this is not the person we saw two weeks ago、uh, on that debate stage, where he had perhaps the worst night of his presidential campaign. Will this be enough? To stem the tide, we'll wait and see. But he's really also used the opportunity to lay into、uh, his rival Donald Trump, saying even NATO leaders were saying to him, "You better win." I'm not having any of my European allies come up to me and say, "Joe, don't run." What I hear them say is, "You've got to win. You can't let this guy come forward. He'd be a disaster." Be a disaster. President Biden, he says he's not going anywhere, but the polling suggests that he will lose in November unless he turns this campaign around. And 67% of Democrats polled this week say they want him to step aside in the race. The question is, will he step aside? The answer is no at the moment. And if he does, who will it be? Will it be Kamala Harris, the vice presidential、uh, uh, running mate that he has for re-election? Well. There could be a fight over that.、Uh, he said, if anyone wants to challenge him, he can do it. They can do it at the convention. That's about six or seven weeks away in Chicago. We'll see if the candidacy lasts that long. But he really is fighting to stay in the race. That was Nathan King in Washington. Staying in the U.S., hospitals in Texas are struggling to treat patients amid a heat wave after Hurricane Beryl left millions of homes and businesses without power. Tony Waterman reports from Austin. Officials are urging people to drink plenty of water, to stay out of the sun, and to take cold showers to try and limit the number of heat-related emergencies, which the Houston Fire Department chief says have spiked in the past few days. But some of those people who need care are hitting a wall. Hospitals in the city are absolutely overflowing, and part of the problem is that there is a backup in discharging patients. Doctors don't want to send people who are still recovering to homes with no electricity, and because space is so limited, ambulances are waiting hours to drop off new patients, which has caused an ambulance shortage. The lieutenant governor saying that even a police officer. Who Who had been shot in the leg was having difficulty getting a room. Now, to ease the bottleneck, officials have deployed additional ambulances and have also set up 250 beds inside a Houston arena. Twelve hospitals in this county are still on internal disaster. We continue to have our field hospitals set up at NRG Stadium. We continue to bring EMS units and resources in to support local 911 needs, as well as put staff at those hospitals, so that when an ambulance goes to the hospital with an acute patient, that they can get that patient seen and turned over to the doctors and nurses in the ER, and that ambulance can get back out on the street for the next 911 call. 
As of Thursday morning, more than a million homes and businesses were still without power. Houston's main utility provider, Centerpoint Energy, says it's aiming to get 750,000 more back online by Sunday night, but that would still leave hundreds of thousands in the dark. Now, Beryl was a record hurricane, the earliest Category 5 to form in the Atlantic, and it could be a harbinger of what is to come. Meteorologists at Colorado State University now saying, that this Atlantic hurricane season is going to be even more active than originally forecast. It's now expecting 12 hurricanes, six of which could be major. This is about double the average, and really it is record warm water temperatures due to climate change that are to blame teeing up a potentially devastating and deadly next few months. That was Tony Waterman in Austin, Texas. Turning to Africa, Cape Town is reeling from the impact of an unprecedented level 8 storm that swept through the region in South Africa, bringing heavy rain and strong winds. Emergency services are on high alert as the city deals with extensive damage. Julie Shire reports. Battered by weeks of relentless cold fronts, Cape Town's residents are facing a multitude of challenges. Several areas were flooded after heavy winter rains and gale force winds battered the city, ripping off roofs from homes and damaging thousands of makeshift dwellings. Weinberg resident Kamal Harris recounted the harrowing experience. It happened really quickly. Um, I've not experienced sort of a natural event like that before, but from what I can surmise in terms of the damage, it looks like definitely a tornado. Thankfully, the families that were all impacted by this are okay now. So I think the fact that there's no harm done to anyone, that's a good thing. Um, Now we just need to make sure that we settled in somewhere. Authorities are working tirelessly to provide relief and support to affected communities. The officials are responding as fast as they can uh, and getting residents to alert us to when things are happening. Um, So whether it's power, uh, whether it's sewage overflows often happening because what we have a lot of is people storm water flows into the sewage system which cause the sewage system to overflow. The homeless have sought refuge in emergency shelters which are now operating at full capacity. As residents begin to rebuild and the homeless find shelter, the South African Weather Service warns of more severe weather ahead. The city braces for the next wave, preparing for the challenges yet to come. That was Julie Shire reporting from Cape Town, South Africa. In the Middle East, U.S. President Joe Biden says U.S. mediators were making progress in reaching a Gaza true steel. From Tel Aviv, here's Jonathan Regev with the latest on ceasefire talks. We've actually heard a statement from the White House saying that there is progress, that there are positive signs, and things are looking better than they looked uh, in in the previous months. Such a statement would not have come out unless there was something behind it. Uh, We know that there are um, quite uh, intensive talks over the past few days. Uh, There were negotiations in Doha, Qatar on Wednesday, and an Israeli delegation is meant to fly to Cairo for the continuation of uh, those negotiations. We're speaking of two different paths. One is uh, between Israel and Hamas regarding a hostage deal. The other is between Israel and Egypt regarding control of what is known here as the Philadelphia Corridor, which separates the Gaza Strip from uh, Egypt, from the Sinai Peninsula. In both of these paths, as far as we understand, progress has been made. That still does not mean that we will see a uh, deal coming to fruition. There are still obstacles, there are still differences, uh, especially between Israel and Hamas, and especially on the issue of what happens next, what happens after, uh, for example, the first stage of uh, the the, uh, hostage deal. Can the negotiations on a second stage go on and on uh, until an indefinite time, as Hamas is asking, or will there be a deadline, uh, as Israel is asking, uh, will Israel be allowed to to, uh, continue with the war, or will the ceasefire become uh, permanent? Many questions still to solve, but it seems that there is some progress, uh, this according to American sources, clearly more positive signs uh, in the sense than we've seen in previous months. That was Jonathan Regev in Tel Aviv. Elsewhere in Asia, China has released a joint critique of the 2016 South China Sea arbitral ruling. The report came one day ahead of the anniversary when a tribunal issued a final award on the South China Sea arbitration eight years ago.
The critique slammed the jurisdiction of the arbitral award. It also refuted the issues of interpretation and implementation of the law raised by the ruling. The critique pointed out the error of the ruling and its negative impact on the international rule of law. It also reiterated China's position all along that the tribunal violated the principle of state consent. Meantime, the country is urging the Philippines to stop baseless allegations on the South China Sea issue. It says accusations and smears by other countries against China on the South China Sea issue are groundless and unacceptable. Gao Yiming speaks with Lei Xiaolu and Wu Shichuan, both experts on the South China Sea, for more insights. In 2013, the Philippine administration brought an arbitration case over the South China Sea dispute with China. Prompting a five-member arbitral tribunal, in 2016, the tribunal issued a so-called final award, denying China's long-standing historic rights in the South China Sea. The Chinese government immediately declared the award null and void. China neither accepts nor recognizes it. In 2006, China made an exclusionary declaration under Article 298 of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. It states that China does not accept any of the compulsory settlement procedures provided for in the Convention with respect to disputes concerning maritime delimitation, among others. And the South China Sea Arbitration Tribunal ignored China's declaration and forcibly exercised this jurisdiction. We can also see that the arbitration tribunal has made a lot of jokes. For example, in interpreting Article 121 regarding the definition and judgment of islands, the tribunal completely deviates from the national practice of the entire world and the international community. Former President of the International Court of Justice, French Judge Gilbert Guillaume, once said that the arbitral tribunal was simply rewriting the relevant provisions of the convention. The very formation of the tribunal has also raised a lot of doubts. Five judges are composed entirely of European judges. A judge comes from Ghana, an African country, but he has lived in England for a long time, so can be regarded as an European. The others are from France, Germany, the Netherlands, and Poland. They have no understanding of Asian affairs and the South China Sea issue. The South China Sea issue is not a simple maritime dispute issue, so it is unrealistic that you can solve it with just a few arbitrators. In November 2015 in Ottawa, I asked the Junji Yunagi a question. I said China and Japan have territorial disputes, and as the president of International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea of Japanese nationality, you should rescue yourself from the appointment of arbitrators in the South China Sea arbitration case. He avoided my entire question and I did not answer. Following the tribunal's decision, the Chinese Foreign Ministry released a statement. It said the Philippines violated its standing agreement with China to settle their disputes through bilateral negotiation. It also violated China's right to decide its own means of settling a dispute as a state party to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. The South China Sea Arbitration Award, as an award, cannot be a part of international law in itself. A politically manipulated, erroneous, and biased arbitration award, if made a part of international law, will have an indelible negative impact on the integrity, authority, and fairness of the international rule of law. China has also made it clear that no political manipulation, disguised as legal moves, will go anywhere, or deter China from safeguarding its territorial sovereignty and maritime rights and interests. That was Gao Yiming reporting. Finally, the world has just marked its 35th Population Day. The global population is expected to reach a peak of around 10.4 billion people in around 60 years. That's according to the World Population Prospects report released on Thursday. For more, Jody Jacobs hears from UN experts. There are eight billion people in the world today, and according to the United Nations, the population is expected to reach a peak of around 10.4 billion people by the mid 2080s. The report comes at a time when the demographic landscape of many countries 
is changing rapidly, sometimes creating anxiety and sometimes confusion. Due to rapid declines in fertility levels, is some of the world's most populous countries. But despite the UN's predicted decrease in China's population overall, the world's population is set to increase. And what will a world look like with 10 billion people? Nobody really knows, I think, clearly what's the world going to be like in, in 60 years uh, from now. Uh, in terms of the population and the significance of that, I, I think you know, it's important to consider the, the, the impact of having a larger population, the population does continue to grow, so the impact that humans have on the environment and the world continues to increase just as a function of how many of us there are. But at the same time, one thing that we try to emphasize in this report is that human behaviors matter more than human numbers when it comes to the impact on the environment. The recent past has seen enormous changes in fertility rates and life expectancy. Back in the 1970s, women had on average 4.5 children. And by 2015, fertility for the world had fallen to below 2.5 children. Another significant change, according to the experts, is that global life expectancy has now reached 73 years. That's an increase of about eight years since 1995. The experts say life expectancy has now returned to pre-COVID-19 levels in nearly all countries around the world, meaning that in the coming years, people will live longer. That was Jody Jacobs reporting. Recapping today's headlines, questions and concerns now surround U.S. President Joe Biden's candidacy after he held a news conference at a NATO summit in Washington to insist that he would stay in the race for the White House. China is urging the Philippines to stop baseless allegations on the South China Sea issue. And the world has marked its 35th population day, as the global population is expected to reach a peak of around 10.4 billion in around 60 years. That's it for this edition of The Top Story, a podcast that brings you world headlines every weekday. For more news in politics, business, sports and culture, you can subscribe to The Beijing Hour, a one-hour podcast news magazine program. We would welcome and appreciate all ratings and reviews. I'm Xi Zhi. Thank you for listening.